Hello and welcome. You're watching Business Today. I'm Sakshi Batra, and this is a very special show as I'm joined by a very, very special guest, someone who is one of the most powerful voices in the Indian financial ecosystem today, one who is widely regarded as the girl with a broken neck over the internet, and the one who actually went on to becoming one of the youngest CEOs in India. I'm talking about Ms. Radhika Gupta, MD and CEO Edelweiss. Welcome, Radhika, and thank you so much for taking the time out. And it's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much, Sakshi. Delighted to be here. Uh, well, I uh, wanted to begin by congratulating first on your uh, first book, Limitless, The Power of Unlocking Your True Potential, which we will be discussing a lot about uh, on the show. And also because you just announced um, on the internet that you're going to be a mother soon. So many, many congratulations to you for that as well. Thank you. So let me just start off with the book. Let's uh, dig right in. I want to begin by saying that or asking you rather, uh, how is the girl with a broken neck looking to unlock the true potential of others with this newly launched Limitless? So I think the reason I had, as I, you know, I had never thought of doing a book. I have loved to write since I was a kid. It's perhaps the only hobby I've really had because I, I don't do all the painting and singing and dancing. I have none of those skills. Um, but after the girl with a broken neck, I think what happened is I received a lot of um, you know, stories, uh, some of which I talk about in the book of people, their questions, their grapples through their careers, uh, as I engaged with my audience on social media. Um, and I thought, why not take stories? I think one of the learnings, even from that video was that storytelling is super powerful. So yeah. why not take stories, my own and also other stories that have inspired me, um, yeah. and use it to answer some of the questions that all of us have as we navigate our careers. And, you know, look, I had the time to do this during COVID and, uh, yeah. you know, writing a book is a labor of love. So that's what Limitless was. But I think that's that's been the journey. Right. But what really drove you to write so freely about rejections and failures? I mean, I was reading right at the beginning, you actually talked about something uh, which, in a, which is an extremely personal thing. Help us understand what drove you to share such experiences with all the readers. Yeah. And that's, and you know, that experience has been talked about in a video, but I've shared yeah. lots of personal experiences through yeah. this. And I think the reason was that, you know, uh, we are brought up in a world, especially a social media driven world, um, where we broadcast a lot of our success. You know, uh, a LinkedIn profile makes everyone, you know, you think that everyone has a perfect job and an Insta profile probably makes you think everyone has perfect relationships and vacations. Um, and life is really not like that. I think we are all a product of failures, insecurities, challenges, rough days at work, bad conversations in offices like these. Um, and the idea of sharing stories was to normalize them yeah. uh, and to tell people that you don't need to have it all together. And in each of these things, you can also find a takeaway and move forward. And look, I come from the markets profession, I think, uh, and the book has a lot of personal finance analogies as well, even though it's not a finance book. Um, you know, we're taught that the graph of life is fine. The graph of markets is finally upwards. They create tremendous wealth, but it's not a straight line journey. Absolutely. You are right uh, over there. Um, would you also say that you believe today more than ever, there is a dire need to talk about the ways one should handle failure, given the increasing mental health issues that are coming to the fore, especially after the two years of pandemic, the most unprecedented times that we've gone through? Oh, absolutely. And I've spoken about this on many platforms before. Yeah. Uh, as someone who leads people, um, I've seen that mental health challenges in our own offices and, you know, offices of many colleagues are at a high. In fact, you know, there's statistics to quote that India has grappled with some of the toughest mental health challenges over the last two years. So I think the whole thing about having open, honest conversations about tackling some of the difficult questions, the various elephants in the room, it needs to happen. And honestly, it, some of these are not dining table conversations. So, uh, you know, our parents' generation came, was a very different one. Uh, and you'd expect a lot of these conversations to happen in homes. I don't think they do. So I think books, forums, conversations are absolutely needed to have these. Uh, you know, because in an organization can have employees that are free from these challenges, it's when they really live their potential. When you're weighed down by the challenges of 
or this is in the back of my mind or this is bothering me or I'm not perfect enough, yeah. it automatically creates a drag at the workplace as well. Mm. Absolutely. Um, if you were to look back, what advice would you really give to your 21-year-old self uh, who was facing these kind of rejections back then and how you have gone through all of those uh, and you know, climbed all the adversities, been a successful person at who you are right now? What would you look back and suggest? I mean, my wish would be that there was more self-confidence uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, that's, that's the last and final theme of my book as well. I also know that self-confidence is something that is acquired. So while it's nice to say in hindsight that I wish I was far more self-confident with what I was at 21, uh, yeah. it's hard to do and it's an evolution. But I do wish uh, that there was more self-confidence in who you are and what you are. Absolutely. And just that is enough. Yeah. Uh, now, having achieved so much already, Radhika, at a young age, who do you or what do you aspire to do now? Oh, it's, it's just really hard to say. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think life is long. Um, I, I, I hope to do a couple of things. Uh, one is I, I love the job I'm doing. Uh, I think the industry I'm in allows me to work with blacks and crores of Indians on, uh, yeah. you know, working through their savings. And, you know, mutual funds are not just mutual funds. They are a tool to achieve dreams. So I'm very grateful for what I do now. But I enjoy leading people. I enjoy building businesses. Uh, and I hope to keep doing that. Uh, I do hope at some point to contribute to society and the nation uh, in a larger role. Uh, I don't know what that will be and I don't want to make statements. And at the same time while doing that, um, I also believe that we can have very rich professional lives while pursuing our passions and our hobbies. Uh, and that's the second thing I hope to be able to do. Um, I hope to be able to pursue my passions for various things. And finally, to create impact in people's lives. Absolutely. And you are already doing that uh, uh, by, you know, contributing to the financial and personal financial world as well for a whole lot of us who've been able to, uh, you know, chart our own personal finance journeys uh, with people like you and following uh, people like you too. Uh, you also share in your book that the most valuable asset one possesses is perhaps oneself. And that's where when we must invest in to achieve success. How does one really go about doing that? I think I, I said that in the context of a lot of young people asking me today, you know, what's the mutual fund I can invest in or the stock yeah. I can invest in or the crypto I can invest in to make the maximum amount of money. Um, and while money making is great, I think your 20s are a time to max out your own talent and your own opportunity. So you can go invest in whatever you want, but that's not going to change your life truly. And I, this is someone who sells funds for a living, right? Okay. Uh, what is going to change your life is dreaming big, taking risks, you know, pursuing your passions. All of that is going to, you know, going out and meeting people, adapting to the chaos around you, maximizing the opportunity that, that is India, uh, actually. Um, and so I said that in that context, that for each of us, the biggest return you will get, if there's one asset, you'll get it on is your time and your energy, especially when you're younger. This yeah. answer will be different when you're 60 or 70. But in your 20s and 30s, this is the time to max out talent. Okay. And you did talk about, you know, taking risks. And uh, there are a lot of lessons also on entrepreneurship in your book. So if one were to really start the entrepreneurship journey, we are already seeing a phase of great resignation. Yeah. During the pandemic, a lot of youngsters, they actually thought about starting something small themselves. You also talk about small is powerful in your book as well. So help us understand what lessons can, uh, you know, youngsters really draw on entrepreneurship from your book. So I definitely talk about entrepreneurship. I talk about my own entrepreneurial experiences, experiences of others as well. I talk about the beautiful side of entrepreneurship. I also talk about the less glamorous side of entrepreneurship because, uh, as I say, that uh, you know, uh, not every entrepreneurial pitch uh, looks like what Shark Tank is. Uh, yeah. it's not reality, uh, and not every entrepreneurial venture turns out to be a unicorn. So I talk about that. Uh, but I talk about both the good and bad sides. I talk about entrepreneurship in the context of change as well. And I think finally, I talk about the fact that, you know, you can start very small in most things in life and uh, 
you know, I, I talk about a less known entrepreneurial venture of mine, which is not uh, forefront capital. So uh, there are many layers and paths to entrepreneurship uh, that I cover. Yeah, and you know, as a sneak peek, would you want to share something of your first entrepreneurship journey back in your college days, which I read in the book, and that's completely different from what you actually started off in the financial world as. So two different things completely. I was, that also is so a lesson. It was a good venture. It was making chapatis. <laughs> and how was your experience back then? <laughs> it was very good. Look, I don't come from a business family. I don't come from a corporate family, but... Uh, I think the rush of building something uh, is, you know, is incredible. I also, by the way, talk about the fact that it is um, in some sense a myth that when you move companies, I also talk about selling companies because one of the things I've also done is been a promoter of a company and sell one to anyways. So I talk about the difference. Between, and that's that's something many people, by the way, grapple with, um, yeah. you know, and typically when you do this kind of stuff, people say don't sell, everyone will eat you alive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I also talk about that bit. Absolutely. Now, like talking about SIPs as well, you refer to SIPs in a very different way as small is powerful in your book. So I would want to understand if that is also true for investing in stock markets, because that's your forte and you know, you come from there, if you can explain to all our viewers, can one really truly accumulate wealth by just doing small SIPs in mutual funds or in stock markets or wherever they want to invest in? I think so. And I think people, you know, it's very, how many, it's very sad that people will say I invested in this stock and it became a multi-bagger and XYZ happened. But unfortunately, no one goes and says I did an SIP and, you know, here I am sitting with 5x of my portfolio because it's perhaps less glamorous to talk about an SIP. Um, but I think many, many, and look, I talk to hundreds, thousands of investors. There are so many incredible stories of how people started this small little habit of saving, this humble little habit of saving. And 10 years later, they're buying a house, they're funding a child's education, some dream is coming through. And I mean, look, if you were to talk about the humble, the power of the SIP, I yeah. think yesterday the data came out, the SIP took this 12,000 crores. A few days ago, Honorable Finance Minister made a statement that while well, FIIs may do whatever they do, uh, you know, DIIs and arm Indian investors, really common Indian investors have held the market through. So, you know, I, I had tweeted this, I, you know, in reference to a film line, but SIP ki taakat, um, it's 12,500 crores a month. Okay, that is what we look to achieve that, you know, more and more people actually get started on their uh, simple and, you know, systematic way of investment journey too. I hope after listening to you, they do that if they have not done already. So let's come to the market outlook part as well. I want to understand from you, how do you see the ongoing financial year after nearly 100% upside in the past two years? And which sectors and themes would you be bullish on now going forward? Sure. So I think one, we have to realize we're coming in the back of two incredible years for markets. Uh, and there is a natural leveling off. In fact, in a note release last year, at the end of last year, we did say the first half of the year, uh, calendar year will be extremely volatile. Uh, and while no, no one could have predicted Russia, Ukraine, that's exactly what it has been. Uh, yeah. And we believe it will continue to be that given all the geopolitical noise in so many parts of the world, rising rates, commodity prices. I mean, you know, all this has been talked about. Perhaps in the second half, things will start to settle down. Uh, earnings growth so far has been reasonably robust, particularly in segments like financials. Um, and I think in terms of sectoral biases, while we run diversified funds, our funds tend to be a little bullish on financials. Uh, our funds tend to be bullish on the capex recovery of the economy mm. and to a certain extent IT as well. Okay. Uh, could you also explain to all our viewers what is your style of investment? How do you really approach the markets? And if you were to invest 10 crore rupees in this current market, how would you really segregate and, you know, diversify and invest? Look, so as a house, I think, you know, we operate on a framework that we broadly call FAIR. We look at companies with strong underlying growth we pay a lot of attention to governance and we pay attention finally to the pricing that we uh, buy them at and finally we are very true to label in our funds i don't think uh, 
we want to do anything wild in our fund if we run a mid cap fund we want to run it like a mid cap fund so uh that's how we invest as a house um and i think personally uh if you were to ask me how i invest uh the answer would be very simple um it's all mutual funds or largely all mutual funds um okay i uh invest and i believe every individual should invest for their risk appetite in their unique set of circumstances uh in my case my husband and i are both markets professionals so life is pretty volatile professions are very volatile so my, our favorite fund is something called the balanced advantage fund it's a mix of equity and debt so yeah. a lot of the portfolio goes there we have okay. some national exposure and some mid and small cap we love doing sips we were just chatting uh in fact yesterday about how we very aggressively do sips with our post tax and come and how big our portfolio has become by just doing sips okay uh, okay you're a great believer in walking the sip talk amazing so i want to also ask you on based on your recent tweet on mutual funds as well so what do you really accord more importance to choosing the right mutual fund or staying invested for long term beat any mutual fund staying invested yeah i can tell you even probably the worst performing mutual fund on the equity side i don't want to name it has outperformed your traditional instrument well thanks a lot radhika it's been a pleasure thank you sachi if you like the video do like comment share and subscribe